Good day. My name is Michelle Lavander, and I'm the director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today for our conversation with infectious diseases specialist, internist, and epidemiologist, Dr. Celine Bounder. Today, we'll be talking about what we know so far about Omicron. With the holiday season before us, the US is already seeing an alarming spike in coronavirus cases, while the unvaccinated are at the greatest risk the new Omicron variant has given rise to fears of a terrifying new twist in the pandemic, even for those who have taken every precaution. The variant, known for what scientists call immune evasiveness, has struck at a time we are all weary of precautions and when holiday get-togethers seem like they will inevitably bring more COVID-19 cases. Public health officials are talking about a triple whammy that could hit us in January of new cases of Omicron and Delta variants, as well as the seasonal flu. But we also risk jumping the gun with our panic as so much about this new variant remains unknown. Here to help us decipher all this is Dr. Celine Gounder, a clinical assistant professor of medicine and infectious diseases at New York University's Grossman School of Medicine. She cares for patients at Bellevue Hospital Center and is also the CEO and founder of Just Human Productions and the host and producer of American Diagnosis, a podcast on health and social justice, and Epidemic, a podcast about infectious diseases and pandemics. Dr. Gounder previously served on the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board, and she's a medical journalist and a fellow of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, the Commonwealth Fund, and individual supporters like you. You could tweet about this webinar with the hashtag Omicron, and we will be archiving this conversation later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A quick word about our format today. We'll be hearing from Dr. Gounder first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions. Because we have many people joining us on the Zoom, we ask you to write your questions into the Q&A panel. You can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems as well. Well, let's get underway, Dr. Gounder, with some basic questions on where things stand with Omicron. The CDC just had a briefing yesterday and sounded the alarm about this triple whammy. What do we know so far and how worried should we be? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, with respect to the rise of Omicron, and um, you know, just to get us off, uh, get us started on that, um, Omicron can be pronounced any number of different ways. I think people have been worried about, am I saying it right? You could say Omicron, 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 all of them are fine. Um, with respect to the rise of Omicron, um, what we have seen is that the numbers are shooting up in the New York um, area. So um, the HHS region that includes uh, New York also includes New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. That um, surveillance um, geographic area is already seeing about 13% of COVID cases are Omicron. Across the country, we're seeing about 3% of cases are Omicron. And I, I suspect that those numbers are going to shoot up dramatically in the next couple of weeks, as we have seen in other countries that face an Omicron spike, whether that was South Africa or some of the countries in Europe. Uh, and so I do anticipate we're going to see numbers um, uh, increasing over the course of December into January. I would predict right now, and, and um, no prediction is, is perfect as we know um, in the pandemic, but I, I would say probably looking at an Omicron um, wave peaking in late January and then coming down um, sometime in February. Um, at the same time, you have the circulation of Delta. We were already heading into a winter surge with Delta before the Thanksgiving holiday and before the emergence of Omicron. Um, and we were seeing hospitalizations and deaths increasing. Uh, we're at somewhere around 1,300 deaths per day in the United States uh, from COVID right now. Um, and I do think you're going to continue to see Delta contributing to cases and deaths um, over the coming weeks. It's unclear between the two which will eventually come to dominate. Um, Initially, you may have some um, 
fitness advantage of Omicron over Delta because Omicron is what we call immune evasive, something we'll get into in a little bit more later in the conversation, I think. Um, and so in other words, our immune systems, um, if they have previously been exposed to uh, the virus, so if, if we've had an infection or if we've had vaccination, those are more protective against Delta than against Omicron. So Omicron has a survival advantage, a fitness advantage uh, between the two. But once you've had a wave of Omicron, it's unclear whether that virus will continue to have that um, advantage. And so you could see there are a couple different scenarios. One is that Omicron comes to dominate as did Delta before it, and that that becomes the common variant. A second possibility is that you have a wave of Omicron, uh, but then that subsides and then Delta um, continues to be the dominant strain. And that's a little bit like what you saw with um, the beta and gamma variants regionally um, in uh, South Africa and Brazil. Uh, and then the third possibility is that both viruses continue to circulate um, and, and in some sort of um, equilibrium. Uh, and, and we just simply don't know which of those it's going to be yet. But I, I think um, from a hospital healthcare utilization perspective, I do think we anticipate um, an increase in hospitalizations, increase in deaths, uh, and uh, increasing burden on the healthcare system uh, over the next couple of months. Thank you. Now, reporters have been calling Omicron mild in many stories, even though they include some caveats. You and others have cautioned that the word mild may not fully convey the risks uh, when we're talking about a variant that is so transmissible. Walk us through that math and the potential disruptions that could lie ahead. So um, there are a couple different um, angles into this question. So one, first of all, if you think about when you're calculating deaths from an infection, very simply, um, deaths equals the number of cases times the case fatality rate. So the case fatality rate, right, is the percentage of people who end up with a case who end up dying. And there are um, different case fatality rates for different age groups and so on, but let's just keep it simple. So deaths equals number of cases times case fatality rate. And I'm sure many of you remember early in the pandemic, people said, oh, well, the case fatality rate of COVID is, I don't know, only 1%. Well, the challenge there is even if you have a, an infection with a case fatality rate of only 1%, if millions of people get infected, uh, have a case, you still have um, thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of deaths out of those millions. And so this is precisely how this has played out. Uh, we have seen many, many deaths. And um, now that you have a, a new variant, maybe let's say the case fatality rate of Omicron is a quarter of uh, what, the, what it was with the original variants. So let's say 0.25%. But then if you have four times as many people being infected because it's simply a more transmissible, more infectious variant, you're basically net even in terms of your number of deaths. So I think that's, that's one way to think about this. I think another is that it really, um, how, how virulent, so virulent means how severe is the d disease in an individual who is infected. The virulence uh, really depends on the age of the person you're talking about, as well as other demographics, but age is probably the most important one. So a virus that may be mild in a young, healthy person may be quite virulent and deadly uh, to, to an individual who's much older. Uh, so you really do need to look, um, stratify, so to speak, how virulent is the virus uh, by age, by demographics, and then also by immune status. So are you talking about a person or people who have never been infected, never been vaccinated? Are you talking about somebody who's had prior infection, perhaps a remote infection early in the pandemic or a very recent infection? Are you talking about somebody who's had one, two or three doses of vaccine? And are you talking about somebody who has been infected and has had some number of doses of vaccine? All of those groups are different. And so you really need to look at what is the virulence in each and every single one of those groups. And once you do that kind of stratified analysis, it simply just takes more time than looking at population averages, where population averages can obscure the fact that this could in fact be a very virulent uh, virus in certain subgroups. So this is why we've cautioned, you know, with the, with the early data coming out of South Africa, much of that was in young, relatively healthy, 
uh, college student age people um, that you really should not be drawing conclusions based on how Omicron plays out in that population. And while we're talking about data, you've pointed out that what we know so far about Omicron could be somewhat lead, uh, misleading because um, where we're seeing the numbers uh, crop up at higher levels might be related more to the testing capacity of certain states in the US, which can vary widely. So tell us about that and also what re questions reporters should be asking their local officials in that regard. So you won't find if you don't look, if you don't test, and there is quite a wide range in terms of what proportion of COVID positive specimens get sent to labs for genomic sequencing. Um, and so that not every specimen gets genomic sequencing, uh, and that really ranges from anywhere from one to 30%. And then an even smaller proportion gets submitted to GISAID, um, which that, that is what you see on this map is see, um, percentage of specimens that have been sequenced and then submitted to GISAID, which is the international um, database of, of those sequences. Uh, so you can see, you know, some states are doing much better on this than others. And so was it surprising that California, which was um, sequencing about 15%, um, so that's about the average for the country, about 15% of their cases would be the first to pick up Omicron. It's not entirely surprising. It's, you know, it's a big state, um, so they're more likely to have a case of Omicron. They're, you know, a big travel hub. Uh, in multiple cities um, in, in uh, California. And then on top of that, they're testing a relatively sizable proportion of their cases. So it's not surprising they would have picked it up, um, be among the first to pick it up. And, you know, I think a state like, well, uh, you know, one of the more uh, relatively rural states um, might be less likely to pick, up, pick it up uh, early on, in part because um, they may not have the same exposure through travel, but also because many of those states are just simply testing less. Thank you. And scientists are using the phrase immune evasiveness when they talk about Omicron. So um, tell us a little bit about what that means and just how much less effective uh, post-vaccine antibodies are against Omicron compared to the um, earlier variants um, in what we're seeing in the early studies, and, and what does that mean for, for our protection? So one way I, I try to um, explain this um, is by analogy with strips of Velcro. So think of um, each antibody as like a tiny little strip of Velcro. And um, let's say um, one strip of super sticky Velcro was enough to recognize the virus before. Today with Omicron, you need 20 or 40 pieces of Velcro that are just not very sticky, but with 20 to 40, you can actually um, still catch the virus. You just need more strips. And that's essentially what's happening here with um, uh, Omicron and our antibodies is where a certain number of antibodies with a certain stickiness uh, we're able to recognize Delta and the prior variants. They're not as sticky for Omicron, but if you, if you, you can override that drop in stickiness by just having more. And, th and that's where a giving that additional dose of vaccine is helpful in that in the short term, you are able to increase the numbers of antibodies, um, bump up the numbers um, so that you can override that relative immune evasiveness. In the longer term, the hope is that you actually make the antibodies more sticky because what you're doing is you're trying to increase the range of variants that the antibodies, the immune system can recognize. Um, and to what degree we can do that, that's still something that's being assessed. Um, but the short-term benefit is certainly that you're increasing the numbers and can override that loss of stickiness, that affinity, as we call it um, technically, um, by, by having just higher numbers. So as we talk about the stickiness idea, there's been some conversations about whether the vaccine formula for um, should be modified for Omicron. And the Biden administration is saying, you know, that's a no-go and vaccine makers don't seem enthusiastic either. So how, how do you think this might play out? And is, is that a good idea to, to stick with what we have? 
Well, there are some potential downsides um, if we switch to a, an Omicron specific vaccine. So one is how well will that vaccine work against the other variants that are still in circulation? So, you know, it, we absolutely would need to show that something like that works versus Delta. Um, so you want to make sure of that first. Um, you know, another concern is if you're um, uh, shifting vaccine manufacturing from one vaccine to another, what do you lose in, in terms of making that transition? How much supply, how much less supply are you able to make as a result? And how does it complicate um, mass vaccination efforts? Um, so there are some, there's certainly some risks. Um, in terms of benefits, this is sort of what I was getting at is the way our immune system works, it actually makes guesses at how pathogens, viruses, et cetera, might evolve and um, how to stay ahead of the virus. Um, and by giving that third dose of vaccine, we may be doing enough to sort of um, give our immune system the hint, hey, you need to keep guessing and, and increasing the range of variants you might recognize um, by giving that third dose. This is one area that we, we simply don't know enough. We haven't um, uh, done enough studies in part because Omicron is so new um, to know if, if that is indeed what you would get, that you would get um, better, enough recognition of Omicron in the long run um, with a third dose of the vaccine. Um, and, and then also how are you getting ahead of other variants with a third dose that, that also remains um, to be seen. Well, on this topic of what is known and what is unknown, we're being told that we'll find out much more in a few weeks about how deadly Omicron may be. And of course, yesterday the CDC released its forecast showing this um, that some of these fears about transmissibility um, seem to be, you know, coming true. So, what further analysis is being done here and abroad, and how can journalists best stay on top of that? What resources should they be following? Well, I would say read the primary literature. Um, so that means reading um, the science publications, also reading preprints. I would um, become good buddies with your local scientist, um, somebody who's trained in infectious diseases, epidemiology, virology, immunology, vaccines. Those are really the key areas of expertise that you want. Um, somebody who can help you vet those um, preprints in particular, because those have not gone through peer review. This is something I have helped a number of journalists at various publications with, where they'll send me a preprint and say, you know, is, is this for real? Is this um, a well done study? What do you think? So where I'm sort of unofficially providing that peer review, I, I think that's really important because what I have seen is a number of preprints uh, that got spun by lay media without having um, a scientist to sort of look over their shoulder to help them review those papers. And unfortunately, many of those have um, been used to promote disinformation about the vaccines and, and um, immunity from prior infection, what people call natural infection um, or natural immunity and, and so forth. So, um, but I do think it's really important to be looking at the primary literature um, with the help of, of a scientist, that's really where you're going to get your best, um, your best information. And what should we expect to see in the next couple of weeks? What analysis is the CDC doing, their counterparts in, say, South Africa? Uh, what questions might be um, answered co coming up? Well, there's different kinds of studies that are being done. So some of them are laboratory studies. Some of the first studies we saw in Omicron uh, that came out were what we call neutralizing antibody studies, where um, what was done is they took uh, antibodies from the serum of somebody's blood, um, somebody who either had had infection or had vaccination, and they took the antibodies from those people and tested them against the Omicron uh, virus or what we call pseudoviruses, where we make um, harmless uh, virus. Um, uh, non-infectious viruses that um, we can test uh, the antibodies against um, safely. So um, those kinds of studies were being done to assess whether antibodies from people with prior infection or prior vaccination um, would stand up to Omicron. We saw that they do, but that you really need a higher level of antibodies, um, sort of that Velcro analogy again, um, for, for that to work. Um, and then some of the other studies that are being done is um, looking at how virulent the infection is in different populations to some degree that requires uh, 
real world evidence. Um, and we don't go out and intentionally infect people um, as part of a study. So you have to wait for them to become infected, to end up in the hospital, to assess how this plays out in a population. So you really have to just wait for that wave to occur and study in real time. Um, and then there are other kinds of um, clinical studies. Um, for example, uh, some data came out today looking at the levels of virus in different tissues. So in the bronchi, which are the big tubes, your big airways that lead down to the lungs, um, so what were virus levels in the bronchi versus in the lungs themselves? And what we see is that you have higher, relatively higher levels of Omicron in the bronchi, relatively lower levels of Omicron in the lungs as compared to Delta and older variants. And that could explain um, how um, Omicron could be less um, virulent, so causing less disease in the lungs, which is where you get really severe disease. But if you have a lot in the bronchi and the upper airway, that could make it more infectious because it's more, um, it's, it's more easily um, breathed out into, into the environment. So those kinds of studies um, are, are really important at determining these things. In a sense, you look at what the patterns are at the patient level, at the population level, and then you also do lab uh, basic science um, studies to understand, well, why might that be? Uh, and that why matters because it gives you uh, ways to reduce things like um, infectiousness, uh, some strategies to go about that. It gives you strategies for how do you reduce disease. Um, and so that's really the, the mechanism we elucidate, we, we figure out uh, at, a, at a more cellular, molecular level in the lab. And um, the White House and its leading scientists are strongly advising every adult to get a booster. And uh, nonetheless, there are a group of prominent scientists who say that a booster is not necessary. We featured some of those voices in a prior webinar. Those who subscribe to this viewpoint um, point to other indicators of immune protection, such as immune memory and the role of T cells and B cells. I'm thinking of folks like Paul Offit, Marion Gruber, and Philip Krauss, and their recent op-ed in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Their argument against universal boosters for adults is twofold, that the booster campaign distracts from efforts to reach the unvaccinated, and that it includes, and here I'm quoting, exaggerated accounts of the waning efficacy of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. What's your response, especially in light of recent uh, repeated urgings by Dr. Anthony Fauci and the administration that a booster is the best protection? Yeah, like Paul Offit, I have been very vocal on this as well as have some of my other colleagues, uh, people like John Moore at Cornell. Um, I think the disagreement comes down to, it, it's less about the science and more about what it is you're trying to prevent. Are you trying to prevent infections? Are you trying to prevent severe disease, hospitalization and death? Are you trying to prevent long COVID? And so whenever you look at um, a number of vaccine effectiveness, you should ask vaccine effectiveness against what? And so I, you know, the administration strategy of, of boosters for everyone was really about, let's just stop all infections. The reason that is challenging, um, and I think frankly sets them up for failure, is that it's not going to be possible to prevent all infections with these vaccines. And that's for a couple different reasons. So first of all, um, this is a respiratory virus that's transmitted through mucosal surfaces. Our immunity on mucosal surfaces is simply not as good as the immunity you get in your bloodstream and your internal organs. So it's your immune response is much better at preventing that severe disease in your lungs than it is at preventing an infection in your upper airway. Secondly, you're looking at a virus with a very short incubation period. So Delta has an incubation of three to four days. Omicron looks like it has an incubation of two to three days. So incubation period is the time from exposure to symptom onset or when the infection really takes off. Um, other viruses like measles has an incubation period of 10 to 14 days. Uh, smallpox is about 14 days. And this matters because it's really a race between your immune system and the virus. So uh, usually we give a vaccine series and then at some point your um, antibodies do wane. They do not stay high forever. 
after you get a vaccination. And so they come down and then you're reliant on your memory response, but it takes four or five days for your B cells to kick in and start making antibody again. So if you're talking about an infection that has an incubation period of two, three, four days, which is shorter than the time it takes for your B cells to kick in, your B cells, B cells are gonna kick in after the infection has started to take off. So it is just not possible that you're gonna be able to prevent all of those infections. The only way to do that is if you keep reboosting the antibody levels over and over and over again, and we know that within four to six months, those antibody levels will wane after a vaccination. You might maybe be able to stretch it out a lot, a little bit more with frequent boosters, um, but, but not by a lot. So this is why the Israelis, for example, um, about nine or 10 months after third doses, they're, not ta they're now talking about fourth doses. So I do think we have to be clear on what we're trying to prevent and why. Setting the... Um, the goalposts at preventing all infections, unless we're planning to be boosting very frequently, at least probably once a year, you're not gonna be able to prevent all infections. So let's turn to the um, outcome of severe disease, hospitalization and death. Um, the vaccines um, prior to the emergence of Omicron had been holding up very well in most populations, most groups, uh, in protecting against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And where you saw a decrease in infectiveness against those outcomes was among the elderly, highly immunocompromised people, and people living in long-term care facilities or congregate settings. So it may, and this is, you know, really the initial guidance from the CDC was let's give additional doses of vaccine. It was mostly to those groups who were at higher risk for severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Um, so with the rise of Omicron, you do have um, an immune evading variant where I think at least some of us, not all of us, I don't think Paul has changed his mind, but I would agree um, with giving a third dose. Uh, Florian Kramer, who's an immunologist at Mount Sinai, um, who like me had some reservations about um, third doses with the rise of Omicron, emergence of Omicron, I think it makes sense because it's a way of overcoming that relative immune evasiveness. Um, but I think the, the um, outcome of interest should remain severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And um, to this point, you know, frankly, I'm hearing in just in the last two, three, four days, the number of people I've heard from, uh, patients, colleagues, friends, who have had a breakthrough Omicron, pro probably Omicron infection, even despite getting a third dose of vaccine, points to how difficult it is to prevent all infections, even with a, a very effective vaccine. And when we talk about these kind of priorities, um, we also return to the question of health equity, which, which has been an issue throughout the pandemic, mm -hmm. whether it comes to access to testing, to vaccines, and now boosters. With Omicron and other future variants, what equity issues should reporters be attentive to? Well, I was speaking to a friend earlier this morning who's a journalist, um, I, you know, I won't say who it was, but was saying, you know what, I'm going to finish off these two stories and then I'm never writing about COVID again. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm just so over it. And, you know, my reaction to that was like, wow, that's privilege. Um, and, you know, I love this person dearly, but that is privilege to be able to say, I'm not going to face this anymore. I'm not going to cover this anymore. This is not new or interesting anymore. This is exhausting. Um, I mean, especially saying that to those of us who are on the front lines, whether in healthcare or public health, this is something we're going to be dealing with for decades to come. This is our new normal, quite literally. This is our life. Um, and so I would say to journalists, number one, when you do that, when you turn your back on a problem like this, you exacerbate the disparities and inequities. This is precisely what has happened with other diseases like HIV, for example. Um, Ebola was a great example of this. Um, back in 2014, we, uh, there was a lot of a, you know, media circus around the Americans who were flown back to the US who had Ebola. Uh, then you have the last of those Americans who gets discharged from the hospital around the same time that you have our midterm elections in 2014. You know, this has be had become at the time Ebola had become a, you know, a, a wedge issue of sorts. Um, and um, after the election, after that 
American was discharged from the hospital, Americans forgot, the media forgot about Ebola. And the disease was not um, fully um, eliminated from the area for another two years or so. Um, and people were still dying and there was still a lot of work to be done in terms of building health systems and how do you track the disease and uh, vaccine rollout and all of these different aspects. But hey, it wasn't affecting Americans anymore. It wasn't a political football in the, in the midterm election. So who cares? And I think you're gonna see something like this play out again. And, and so the problem is the who cares is being said by people of privilege for whom it does not affect. And so you guarantee that the people who are still being affected, who are the vulnerable, most vulnerable populations, whether it's here in the US or abroad, will continue to suffer, but suffer in silence. And so I, I think there's really an important role of the media to continue to hold us all accountable um, to make sure that um, this continues to be addressed, that we continue to see public health efforts, um, that public health continues to be valued, because I think another tremendous danger is paralleling that um, loss of media coverage is frankly, you also see what follows that is the loss of um, investment in public health efforts. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the media really has a, a responsibility to play here to ensure that doesn't happen. Thank you. That is really good counsel. And, and just to follow up on that, as we think about vulnerable groups, um, which um, has shown to be, for example, communities of color, people who have high interactions with the public and so on. Um, but then of course, the groups that have suffered the greatest fatalities, such as the elderly and the immunocompromised, what um, should those people be doing when it comes to Omicron and, and how about the people around them? Well, if you fall into one of those high risk um, categories or vulnerable groups, you absolutely should get fully vaccinated, get that third dose. Uh, but understand you are still at risk, particularly with Omicron, of a breakthrough infection. Uh, and so if you are somebody who is also elderly, um, immunocompromised, who is more likely to progress to severe disease, um, you know, I think you need to be layering protections. As we've been saying all along, um, vaccines are, are highly effective, very safe. Uh, but especially when you still have high levels of transmission in the community, you are still at risk. Um, and I, I here's some more basic math. So what is vaccine effectiveness? The de definition of vaccine effectiveness is the percent risk reduction from the amount of risk in the community. So if you have a lot of community transmission, um, a 90%, let's just throw out you know, that number, a percent reduction, say from 100,000, brings you down to 10,000. A 90% reduction from 100 brings you down to 10. 10 and 10,000 are clearly very different numbers. So I think it's important to understand, you know, vaccines are great, but they're not perfect. And especially if you're somebody who is in one of those high risk groups for progressing to severe disease, you absolutely need to layer other measures. So what are those other measures? Um, you know, I feel like a broken record, but it's the same stuff we've been talking about throughout the pandemic, it's masks. Um, we would really counsel people up their mask game. We know, um, that there is a hierarchy in terms of levels of protection that N95 respirators are the gold standard, the best among them. Um, they are harder to wear, you know, as somebody who wears them for 12 plus hours at a time when working at the hospital, um, you know, they're not, they're not as comfortable as other options, but they are gonna provide you the most protection. Um, sort of lower on the totem pole after that would be the KN95 or the KF94. Both of those provide very good protection. They also have a tighter seal around the face. You have less air leakage. Um, so that's also um, a very good option. Surgical masks and cloth masks are okay. They're not useless, but they are much um, less effective than the other masks I described. So you have masks, you have ventilation and air filtration. So that's things like opening doors and windows. Um, for your ventilation and air filtration would include things like those HEPA air filtration units. Um, putting them in your living room, dining room, um, and opening up doors and windows. Um, let's say you're having company over, um, over the holidays. You know, that's a really um, good strategy to further improve um, or further lessen the risk. Um, where you're able to do things outdoors. Um, the uh, President Biden, for example, is gonna be hosting um, a holiday Christmas party on the rooftop outdoors of a building. Um, and I think that's a really great way to make some of those kinds of gatherings safe. 
Um, then you have uh, rapid testing. Um, and finally, we're starting to see a bit better access to rapid testing. Uh, the cost still remains too high for most people. The Biden administration has announced that they will uh, have insurance companies reimburse people for the purchases of rapid tests, but that's not happening soon enough for people who are purchasing rapid tests for the holidays. And then if you're somebody who, you know, is struggling to make ends meet, and then you have to purchase four rapid tests, say for a family of four, for one day of testing, and let's say that rapid test costs anywhere from the range is seven to $25, you could be spending $100 to rapid test a family of four in one day, and that needs to be done repeatedly over time. That becomes very expensive, even if you're getting reimbursed, because you have to submit the receipts, wait on that, probably deal with the usual insurance company pushback um, on reimbursement. And, and so that's just not um, a great way to make this more accessible. The administration is also going to be providing rapid tests for free through community health centers, food banks, and some other sites like that. Uh, I think that's great, but it's not in large volume enough. Uh, the current allocation would provide one test to 15% of the population, and that's clearly not enough. Um, and as to frequency of rapid testing, um, especially with Omicron, with that very short incubation period, that zero to three day incubation period, you really need to be testing at least every day now. Um, so every morning over the holidays before you hang out with family and friends um, to make sure that you're relatively safer um, to be spending time with them without a mask. So it's all of those different things. If, you know, if I were to give one example um, to sort of illustrate this, if I had, um, if my in-laws were still alive, they used to live at a um, assisted living facility. Um, they were in Arizona. I would have suggested, let's all have lunch outdoors. Um, you know, they, they were doubly vaxxed, uh, at least my father-in-law who was still alive for COVID. Um, you know, so that they had taken those kinds of precautions, but I would have said, you know, let's do this outdoors. And when we're indoors, we would have been masking. Um, and I think that's how you protect those most vulnerable people. Thank you. We're going to turn now, Dr. Gounder, to questions. We have a bunch of them, and I just want to invite everybody to put your questions in the Q&A portion of our uh, Zoom panel, uh, as opposed to the chat. It's a little easier for us to see those in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. We have a, a question from Melody Schreiber who asks, what should local and state jurisdictions do to prepare for Omicron and the Delta wave? Well, you have two sorts of um, sides to that. You have the healthcare system side. Um, and I think healthcare systems need to have a plan in place for uh, what will likely be a surge in hospitalizations in the coming weeks, um, identifying um, you know, what are staffing plans, particularly over the holidays when staff are going to want to take some time off themselves. We usually are working with skeleton crews over, over the holidays. Um, so that might mean starting to make plans around elective procedures so that you can reallocate that staffing for the truly necessary stuff. Um, you know, assessing what, where do you have the ability to, to um, move staff around, um, where, um, you know, looking at staffing agencies, um, figuring out some of those contracts so that you have uh, the option of, of bringing in outside staff if you need them. Um, and then on the public health side, um, you know, I think some jurisdictions are using wastewater surveillance. I think that's a really useful tool to, to sort of have your finger on the pulse of what's coming and how quickly. Um, not every jurisdiction is using that. Um, really reassessing um, their systems for doing genomic surveillance. Um, what can be done better? How can they improve the numbers that they're sequencing, particularly in areas where they're not sequencing very many? Um, and then uh, really, I think vaccinations are a big part of what needs to be done. And it's particularly vaccinating the unvaccinated that remains the most critical thing we could be doing and doing a lot of community outreach on that front. Um, you know, and then, and then finally, the other components that I mentioned is, is really educating the public about some of those measures. I think people know about masks. They may not know, however, that N95s, KN95s, and KF94s would be the preferred mask. Um, how do you, um, you know, how do you get them? How do you make sure they're the right kind? I think is, is valuable information. 
I think most people have either made up their minds that they are mask wearers or not. <laughs> so I don't know if that's um, a high yield battle at this stage in the game. Um, but I think to, for those who will wear masks to, to be counseled on that. Um, I think um, some of the funds um, from the American Rescue Plan, et cetera, um, are at the state and local level for things like purchasing um, rapid tests. And so this is why you're starting to see some of the tests or some of the states do, uh, going out on their own on this. So Massachusetts, Colorado, and so on, and putting pressure on other states, you know, hey, why aren't you doing the same? Why aren't you spending those funds to buy people rapid tests? Um, so let's see, what did I miss on that checklist? Um, yeah, and then maybe, you know, again, uh, um, reminding people about the value of um, HEPA filtration units. They're not that expensive. They're, you know, one or $200, which um, when you compare that to some of the other things we're talking about, like rapid tests, they're really, you know, in the same ballpark, if not potentially cheaper because it's a durable piece of equipment. Um, so, you know, the, that would be the package of things I would, you know, suggest that um, people be thinking about right now. Thank you for that really thorough answer. We have a pretty scientific question from Dan Keller. So in replying to it, maybe just define some of the terminology. He asks for Omicron and other variants are mutations only or mainly in the spike protein mm. and uh, or are there mutations throughout the virus? If other parts of the virus are not so mutated, would it be advisable to boost the whole virus? <coughs> Sorry or capsid vaccine to give broader immunity to more uh, epitopes? So the vaccines we have currently target the spike proteins. So those are the little projections that you see um, very often. Um, uh, it'll be a, a round virus in the graphic that you see, and then you'll see these little spikes coming off the surface. Those are the spike protein. The vaccines that we currently have are, are meant to develop an immune response against those spike proteins. There are about 50 mutations in Omicron, <clears throat> in Omicron relative to the older variants. 30 of those mutations are in the spike protein, 20 of those mutations are elsewhere in the virus. Um, some of those are in the nucleocapsid, um, sort of thinking about sort of that round part of the virus. Um, and as to um, whether you should have a um, vaccine that targets other parts of the virus that is being looked at, uh, in particular, um, in trying to develop a vaccine that would be effective against a wider range of coronaviruses, so not just variants, but also SARS, perhaps MERS, um, not just SARS-CoV-2. And um, the challenge is you want to target a part of the virus, um, develop an immune response to a part of the virus that actually protects you. Um, and not all immune responses to every part of the virus is necessarily going to protect you. So this is an area of active research. Um, people are looking at this, um, but the spike protein was the easiest target in that we knew um, that if you had an immune response to that, that that would largely be protective. Sorry, we have a couple of long COVID questions. Um, one from Lila Thulin who says, given Omicron's immune erosion and increased transmissibility, what does the risk calculus say about the risk of long COVID for vaccinated people? And Lila goes on to say that she realizes that the full data won't be available for some time, but people are making decisions about this kind of thing now. And then Auburn Scallon asks, <clears throat> when it comes to long COVID, uh, how should that best be communicated, that potential risk across yeah. generations? Yeah, there's still so much we don't know about long COVID. There are some hypotheses about what causes long COVID. Is there the possibility that you have ongoing replication of the virus somewhere in the body? There are parts of the body that we call um, uh, immune privilege sites. So in other words, your immune system doesn't get there, get in there as well. So the brain is an example of an immune privilege site. The testes um, where you know, sperm are manufactured or another immune privilege site. And so we see this with HIV, in fact, that somebody who has very well controlled, suppressed, undetectable viral loads of HIV in their blood can still have very low level of um, HIV replication in, in the spinal fluid and in the brain. 
Um, and, and in that context, it's really a combination of the, the medications and the immune system controlling it. Um, but um, could we have uh, ongoing replication of SARS-CoV-2 in an immunoprivileged site that is triggering um, long COVID symptoms? That's one possibility. Another possibility is that you have fragments of the virus that are lingering that are triggering long COVID. And another hypothesis is that your, your, um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection leads to an autoimmune response where your immune system is turning against your body. Uh, we do know that this can happen with other viral infections. Um, and it is thought that many of the autoimmune diseases people have uh, may have originated in a, probably a combination of a viral infection and a genetic predisposition um, that leads to autoimmune disease. Um, but we don't know. And uh, it's really important to know the mechanism because that really tells you how to prevent it, how to treat it. Um, what we do know is that if you are vaccinated and you have a breakthrough infection, your risk of long COVID is lower. Um, it is hard still to quantify by, by how much. Um, there was a study out of the UK that showed among people um, who had infections after vaccination versus infection without vaccination, um, your odds of progressing onto long, long COVID were decreased by about 50%. Um, so, you know, the, there is some level of protection from vaccination, but it, it's very hard to come up with a public health strategy to prevent long COVID unless you say, well, let's just keep boosting people with vaccine to prevent all infection. I don't know that that's going to be a sustainable uh, public health approach. Another would be, um, well, let's fully vaccinate people and then layer other protections like masking and ventilation, air filtration, and um, rapid testing and so on to, to reduce the risk, especially, you know, if you are somebody who is more worried about long COVID for whatever reason, um, you know, I think it's very reasonable to uh, employ some of those other measures to further reduce your risk. I think um, one thing that will be studied in the near future, I have no doubt, is whether the new antiviral pills uh, so monolpiravir from Merck, uh, Paxlovid from Pfizer, and there's some others in the pipeline, whether those um, treatments for COVID will help further reduce the risk. So let's say, you know, I think the ideal scenario would be you are vaccinated, maybe you have a breakthrough infection, so you, but your risk of long COVID is already reduced because you've been vaccinated, and then you have a breakthrough infection, and then you take something like Paxlovid which would further hopefully reduce your risk of progressing on to long COVID if you, if you have a, a breakthrough. Um, but that remains to be seen. We haven't done those studies yet. We have a question from Vera Veda who says, can you talk more about rapid testing strategy? You said it needs to happen every morning before gathering with family. Can you explain why and how effective are these tests in catching asymptomatic cases? So the tests have nothing to do with symptoms. The tests are really about how much virus is in your body. So the more virus in your body, the more likely the test is to pick up the fact that you're positive. Uh, so that's number one. So forget the symptom thing. That's, that's um, misinformation, so to speak. Um, and then secondly, what determines the frequency of testing? That's how quickly you turn positive from the time of exposure. So again, the definition of incubation period for a virus is time from exposure to time when you develop symptoms or when the infection starts to take off, when you start to see the amount of virus really shoot up. And if that period of time, let's say it's 15 minutes from the time I was exposed to the time I'm infectious, if I'm only testing um, every day, well, I mean, I could have spent the last day, right, infecting other people. Um, if that incubation period is one day, um, if you, you know, test every day or so, um, you're, pro you're probably going to catch it um, in time to prevent onward transmission. And so when you look at why did the CDC change that window for when you needed to be tested prior to travel, honestly, they should have done it when Delta emerged, because Delta had a much shorter incubation period of three to four days versus um, the previous um, uh, variants, which had incubation periods of five to seven days. So um, they were actually slow in tightening up that window um, from 72 to 24 hours. Uh, Omicron has an even shorter incubation period of two to three days. And so if you want to have a reasonable chance of catching 
uh, most of those infections and being able to do something about it, you really um, need to be testing every day. Um, Rochelle Walensky, prior to becoming director of CDC, had done some of these studies on college campuses. How frequently did we need to test um, and, in order to prevent onward transmission? And, and what she and others found was um, on college campuses at that time, so this would have been summer of uh, 2020, say August or so of 2020, at that time, um, this is pre-alpha, pre-delta, um, if you tested once or twice a week, that would have been enough. With the emergence of Delta, we were looking at having to test, say on a college campus, ideally um, three times a week, although many were not doing it quite that frequently. Um, and so you could say that's analogous to every other day. Now with the emergence of Omicron, you're looking at really every day. Wow, that's a logistical nightmare as you know, uh, yeah especially with the availability of these rapid tests. Um, you know, but, but to that, you know, what I would say about that is really the way I would think about it for the holidays is you're using that as a way to decide whether to take off masks. And, um, you know, so if you use your rapid test first thing in the morning, um, and then if you're all negative, you take off your masks, you know, I think that's a good way to use it. But you're not going to be in those kinds of close situations with family and friends every day of the year. I think these are especially concentrated periods of exposure where you really do want to be able to um, behave more freely. I, I will, just to be clear, these are things that will make you safer. Nothing is perfectly safe. So um, I, I certainly know um, of people here in New York where I am who have been trying to do this daily testing and even then they've had some breakthrough infections in those groups. So, um, you know, it is, it is one measure to help further reduce risk, um, particularly if you're gonna be around some high risk people, particularly if you wanna be about, around family and friends and, and take off those masks. So even with where we are with the science, if you have to go back to your college analogy, a group of kids, mm -hmm. you know, sitting in a classroom with, I don't know, 100 or 200 people, you feel like if they're wearing their mask, that's okay, even if they can't have a testing regimen of, of every day. I would say the most important thing would be, yeah, masking and um, improving the ventilation and air filtration in that space. Uh, and that's, so that's something that um, needs to be done with the building maintenance folks to figure out how to do that. It's gonna be different for different spaces, different buildings. Um, you know, but I think that's going to be the highest yield. And then if you can afford to do testing, um, there's different purposes for testing. One is um, the, the rapid testing we've been talking about, which is really to try to identify infectious people and take them out of circulation, so to speak, you isolate them. Another use for rapid testing is really more as surveillance um, and to assess how well your other measures are working. Um, so, you know, is your combination of masks uh, or vaccination, mass air, uh, ventilation, air filtration, is it working? And having a testing uh, regime in place might be less frequent, but really more um, to measure how well those other things are working. And if you need to add something else, uh, you know, that's a different use, uh, but, but can also be very helpful. And we have a question from Courtney Cohn. She says, for journalists, how would you suggest covering Omicron when some scientists and medical professionals disagree on information or health recommendations? Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, you should be careful to look at what are the qualifications of those people who are in disagreement. I think sometimes you have very legitimate disagreements over the science, a little bit like what I was describing with boosters, and, and that really comes down to which outcome matters. And which outcome matters is, a, is not necessarily a scientific question. Um, that the, there is some degree of you know, values and, and other things that enter into that calculation. So I think um, that's another piece of it is um, be clear with people what are the um, outcomes of interest um, and then ask people you know, straight up, what are their biases? Like I, I will tell you, um, you know, I'm very concerned about health disparities and inequities and global vaccine inequity. Um, and, and I think you know, asking people to declare what their biases are, what their values are, will also help you. Um, and then, you know, again, going back to what I was saying at the top, what are their qualifications? You know, are you talking about somebody who's a neuroradiologist or a cardiologist who um, does not have formal training in epidemiology, infectious disease, immunology, virology, vaccinology, 
Has this person ever run a public health program, whether in the United States or abroad? Have they ever worked on issues of health disparity and, and solving that? Have they ever, um, you know, worked on issues of supply chain or, you know, I mean, any, whatever the, the issue of interest is, do they actually have qualifications? Um, I, you know, not to, not to bash on ER docs, but I think very often ER docs have been interviewed about these subjects, but very few of them actually have qualifications on any of the subjects I just listed. They are just the door by which you access the hospital. They stabilize the patient, they may do the initial assessment, but that doesn't make an ER doc an expert on some of these issues. Um, and again, not to bash on any specialty, you know, cardiologists, um, might be very helpful in a patient who has myocarditis or who needs to be put on ECMO, uh, which is the heart-lung bypass machine, but that doesn't make them an expert on all things COVID, and I'm not an expert on all things COVID. So I think you have to really drill down on um, who's, who's an expert in that particular area, and is this a legitimate scientific um, disagreement? I remember seeing a story that went really viral um, in conservative media, quoting somebody from Stanford. And I was like, you know, Stanford, but it was somebody from the Hoover Institution, which is not a medical part of Stanford, who was a military historian. And he just got all this play. So, you know, not even an MD. So good caution there. Um, and, and on that point, also follow the money. Um, look at who funds <laughs> the Hoover Institution. Um, I, you know, I would assume the journalists who are listening to this are aware of who, uh, one, at least some of the big funders of the Hoover Institute. And there are political biases baked in. So, you know, follow the money. And we have a question from John Gresham who says, are there downfalls to boosting COVID-19 immunity via annual booster shots? Is there another approach that might be better or more effective protect individuals and public health? Well, you know, I do think uh, for some populations, we may be looking at annual boosters. It might be a combo flu shot, COVID shot. Um, Moderna is developing one. I think for certain populations, uh, for example, people in a nursing home, that may be what we want to do. Uh, that's a group that does not respond as well to vaccination. Um, there's a phenomenon, phenomenon called immunosenescence where your immune system ages, it just doesn't function as well as it did when you were 20. And so you may not respond as well to a vaccine when you're 80. Um, and then you put a lot of those people who also have other medical conditions um, in close quarters in a nursing home, you know, that's clearly been an, an, um, a recipe for a lot of COVID and a lot of death. Um, so I think you may well see in certain very specific settings, um, yearly vaccination. I think in certain occupations where, you know, me, for example, I have to get a yearly flu shot uh, as a healthcare worker, is that in our future as healthcare workers that to prevent um, our infecting our patients, um, that we would be required to get a yearly COVID shot. I think it's certainly possible. Um, people working in healthcare, uh, in long-term care facilities and congregate settings, that, that may be the case. Um, but I do think we need to look at other strategies. I think one, that is of interest. Um, and to be clear, I don't think any vaccine only strategy is going to prevent all infections. I just don't think that's going to happen, even if you boost every six months. Um, but I think an, an adjunctive strategy would be something like um, mucosal vaccines. So those can be uh, delivered through the nose as a spray uh, or um, as an oral pill. We already have a nasal spray vaccine for the flu. We have an oral vaccine as an example for typhoid. So there are precedents for this. Um, those are, will likely provide better immunity at mucosal surfaces, so in the upper airway, um, for example. Um, but I would, I would be very surprised if you could replace our injectable vaccines with a mucosal vaccine. I think it's probably both together. One, the injectable vaccine providing what we call good systemic immunity, so immunity in your um, bloodstream and your organs whereas the mucosal vaccine um, might provide uh, a boost in the immunity in the upper airway, not eliminating all infections, but um, further, reducing, um, further reducing those infections. And Dr. Gander, we have so many questions, but I also wanna be respectful of your time. Do you have time for maybe one or two more? Uh, one or two more. Okay, so uh, you touched on this earlier, but uh, Jeffrey Klausner says, how can we pivot from the focus on infection prevention to early treatment, 
uh, early treatment can be highly effective to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death, but are not well promoted by the media. And we have other questions from others uh, on this list asking about Pfizer, Pfizer's new antiviral pill, Paxlovid, and asking about, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these right, uh, uh, flovovaxamine. Uh, so I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think to do rapid treatment requires rapid testing. And this is something I've been sort of um, sounding the, the bell, the alarm on <laughs> for a while now with the administration, which is that um, we have to make testing more available. Uh, and ideally, the way you would access um, these drugs is one stop shopping, you get a test, um, if it's positive, you walk out with the pills, uh, not just with a paper prescription, but literally the pills, you would be able to do so without paying anything out of pocket. Um, so if you have insurance, no copay, if you don't have insurance, no cost, um, that needs to be the setup. If you want these medications to have an impact at a public health level, um, and it is, um, not clear that you know we're going to do that, um, frankly, and, and our health system is simply not designed for that. I mean, just calling your primary care doctor's office and saying, "Hey, can I have an appointment?" Um, the chances of you being able to get that appointment within three days, much less than getting the test and the test result and the medications in three days. Um, you know, we, this really will require a huge shift um, in how we think about healthcare delivery and how we do healthcare delivery in this country. Um, many of us are continue to, to push on this, but um, I am concerned that these, these drugs will not have the impact they could have unless we have a real change in, in health infrastructure. We have a question from D Jane Dunnage asking about, uh, I'm assuming this idea of uh, say an annual vaccine or something. Mm -hmm. She says, would a patient with an autoimmune disease have a shorter immunosenescence than the average person? Does it get worn down from overuse? That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I would have to defer to somebody like a Kiko Iwasaki or somebody who, you know, that's really much more, that intersection is much more their focus. I don't know the answer to that. So then I'm going to sneak in one last question. I promise the last one. This is from Emily Mullen, who says, uh, how much is enough sequencing? Some states, as you noted, are sequencing less than 5% of samples. What percentage of cases you need to be sequencing to do accurate surveillance? Yeah, I mean, I think we would like to see somewhere on the order of 15 to 30%. Um, and so there are a lot of states, you know, half of the states are falling below that. Um, we've made a tremendous improvement since early in the pandemic, um, where we were, you know, sequencing very, very few. Um, and now we're at I think 10,000 times as many um, per week as we were early in the pandemic, something like that. Um, so, you know, we've, we've dramatically dr ramped up the volume of testing, but we're not quite where we need to be. And it's still a bit patchy across the country. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gounder, for your time. Um, we know you're extremely busy and really at the forefront of all this. And I want to thank the audience for all their smart questions. We'll be sending you all a survey asking for your feedback on today's program and for your ideas on other topics of interest. Please take a moment to complete it. We'll be archiving this webinar a little later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. And uh, should you want to support uh, webinars like this one in the future, we really rely on individual supporters like you, and you could do so uh, by just following the instructions here. And I want to thank all of you and wish everybody a uh, half happy and safe holiday season and thank Dr. Gounder again uh, for her con contribution to our knowledge.